Hello out there. This is Pamela Fagan Hutchins. You found my page. You found my live video book club series. And today I am with a special guest who I'll introduce in a moment. And um, we're going to be talking book club questions about Snaggletooth. Snaggletooth is the new release in the Patrick Flint series, only available right now as of March 15th when we're recording this um, in uh, audio and print versions, but the ebook is coming out this week on the 17th. And so I thought we'd save the big kahuna for last. I've done this series where I interviewed Perry in real life, my brother Paul, Suzanne in real life, my mom Susie, and now um, the, as I said, the big kahuna, um, the, the person that inspired Patrick Flint, my dad, Peter Fagan. Hi, daddy. Good morning. How are you today? Um, I'm doing good. You, you're missing out in Wyoming today. It is spectacularly sunny and we have clouds all the way up to about 5,500 feet. And so I feel like I'm floating on a cloud. I can't even see your house from here. Oh my. Well, that's a little different than where we are. Yeah. You're over snow Mageddon and ice Mageddon and everything in Texas. There is none left. It's nothing. It's very nice right now. Cool. Well, um, I am, as I, as I told you, I'm going to be talking to you about Snaggletooth first, very briefly, and then we're going to go over um, the Patrickisms or the Peterisms at the beginning of each of the books. And I'm going to make you tell some stories. Oh, we have a cat joining us. Hello, Mitzi Poo. So the, the question for those people that are doing book club today is that Snaggletooth was a book that I wrote um, and that it was really about my love for black tooth on the uh, skyline above me here. And it was for me, for some reason, maybe because it was the fifth book in one year, an incredibly, incredibly difficult book um, to write. And it was intended originally to include rock climbing because you you did some rock climbing for a while in your younger days. But mm -hmm. um, instead, it started with an airplane scene and it became about a family hike up onto the mountain. But it was it was a hard book for me to write. And so the first thing I wanted to ask you is if I came to you and I started whining about, oh, Snaggletooth, and I'm so tired and it's so hard. What would Patrick Flint say to his daughter at that point? I would say you need perseverance. <laughs> <laughs> he would say, suck it up. No pain. Well, no I'm, I might say that, but <laughs> I, I think I think more than anything, it's just uh, you know you you know what you want to do, uh, yeah. even though it's difficult. You just uh, need to keep uh, plugging at it. I feel very confident that you're going to get it done. Uh, not everything is easy. Once when I was in law school, my parents were basically giving me that speech. I didn't warn dad I was going to tell the story. And they very kindly said when I was going, it's just horrible and I'm going to be I'm going to do so badly. And they said, just do your best. We know you're going to do great. No, I'm not. And I got so mad at them that they were putting all this pressure on me and these poor parents. I remember <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> Try hard. People ask if Trish was as bad as I write her. And 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 I think basically she's she's nicer than I was. <laughs> well, you you had your moments, but all kids do. No, oh, you're so sweet. Um, so you got to read Snaggletooth when it was in development, and you helped me with the airplane scenes and the medical scenes. Um, what would you think that Patrick learned from his adventures in Snaggletooth, or did he learn anything? Or is Patrick going to repeat his same mistakes? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, in real life, there was a lot of repetition and mistakes. Uh, you know, I, th I think he would learn that uh, uh, he everybody is capable of more than you think they are. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw that especially with uh, uh, Trish and Perry, that they both uh, responded uh, above and beyond years, but. That's, that was the way it was in real life. You, you know, when you're raising your kids, you look at them as kids. You don't really appreciate what they have become because you usually see them in the past tense as what they have been. And I think you saw in this book that both of them had, you know, had matured above and beyond what you thought of them as. Um, and I, I think that's 
that, that it's surprising to you when you finally see it. But uh, you know, it was it was definitely apparent in Snaggletooth. I also learned that uh, the ability to improvise. Uh, and I always loved wilderness medicine, uh, as you remember, because of that. It was it was a matter of not only knowing medicine, but a, a huge part of it was being able to think things through and being able to come up with uh, answers to uh, difficult problems with, you know, just the common things around you. And uh, it certainly was much different than trying to practice medicine in a hospital setting or a clinical setting. I love that. And it's, it's one of the things I wanted to capture in these books and not being a doctor, it's hard for me. Thank goodness I have you. Um, but the, the, your love for that and that when you go out and you adventure and you're in the wilderness, you only have yourself to rely on and you only have what you either prepare for or you find to take care of whatever comes up. And I really wanted to capture that. Thank you for helping me with it. You did a very good job. <laughs> well, I do a better job after he goes through and corrects everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we, we had to work at a few things. That was <laughs> Exactly. I'm not a doctor. I just play one in books. Um, so the um, the what I what I have enjoyed when I'm thinking up each book is I try to think of something that's occurred in your life that just kind of makes us all go, oh, Peter, so that I can create an oh, Patrick at the beginning of these books at the same time as I really like to set a scene that shows your love of wilderness. So last week, I wish that you could do these book clubs with me. Last week, I was talking with a book club in Denver and they said, you really must be a naturalist. Your books really, the love of nature's there, the plants, the rocks, the whatever. And I said, well, I do. But that's really my dad who wanted to be a wildlife biologist instead of a doctor, but found that being a doctor was more practical. So I try to include that in the beginnings of them as well. So in Snaggletooth, the beginning scene is a father that has taken his surly and unhappy teenage daughter up and is flying and enjoying it and doing all these wonderful things, which is pretty true to life. You, What did you fly back when we were in Wyoming? We had a Pi Piper Super Cub. That's right. And... Um, Paul told this story uh, a couple of weeks ago when he was talking as Perry about that you would take us down to see the animals. Do you um, want to share with everyone what you used to do with your poor children in the plane with me throwing up and Paul going, woohoo? <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I love that. That was the best part about flying to me was being able to see the natural world from the air and uh, many times we would uh, get up. We never went anywhere with the Piper Super Cub. We were always sightseeing. And uh, I love the times. It, you could uh, go up high into the, the mountains themselves. I could pull back on the carburetor heat, pull back on the power, lower the flaps, you know, get the airspeed uh, way down, somewhere around 45 or 50 miles an hour. And we could just slowly mosey our way down the mountainside as we got up high and you could just look into the trees and see all see lots of animals we could see mostly elk and deer and then when we got out on the prairie we loved to chase not not really chase but uh, follow herds of antelope uh yeah we saw coyotes uh we saw bobcats uh uh, just a whole host of, of animals out there. And uh, that's probably the most fun I ever had flying in my life was, was when we had that super gun. I, you know, I laugh because I did barf all the time, but I remember vividly the animals and, and the flow. And we have this airplane that flies down the mountainside here by our house and then swoops down into Little Goose Canyon. And it makes me think of you every time, just that coming down and you, it just looks like the pilots having fun. Um, and it was fun. And even though but I, it's, it's, it's just a wonderful feeling. It's just a wonderful feeling. You're just all alone up there, especially when you cut back on the power, you know, it's very really quite quiet. 
and you're just you just feel like you're almost intruding on you know their world or their space but um, it uh, it's really pretty really beautiful it's funny because when you're hiking and stuff, you don't get that view. They're hidden behind trees or rocks or whatever, and they expect you on foot. And so you, you're right. When you come in from the air, you're kind of uh, sneaking up on them in a new way. And but it is it's a cool way. Um, so at the beginning of each story, each book, I use these stories. That was Snaggletooth. Um, I uh, have used two new ones. I don't know if you've seen Spark where I used your uh, your your fire starter. Um, skills. Um, and then I've got a new one that I'm working on right now. And I'm using a scene where you rode a horse that bucked you off when your hat flew off. This is a recent story, but I, I started with a um, Patrick getting getting thrown in, from a horse and injured and trying to hide it from everyone. So anyway, I have so much fun with these. But one of my favorites was starting snake oil and snake oil for everyone that doesn't remember it is the one where Patrick was volunteering on the Wind River Reservation. In real life, that was an homage to dad's work on Boys Ranch in Texas. Um, he didn't actually work on Wind, Wind River, but uh, it in included a story at the start that was based on a story I love to hear you tell. And that was when uh, Wes Brayton, the dentist in Buffalo back when Ray, 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 Ray sorry, I have him as Wes in the book. So, um, Ray, yeah, Ray. I know. and, um, and so, um, uh, he wanted to give you a ride to Casper, but the interstates were closed. And I wondered if you'd share that story because, uh, I love how you tell it as a Texas boy moved to Wyoming. It was, well, uh, as you remember, it was your uncle that had, uh, come to see us and there was no flights into, uh, Buffalo. And he was coming up from Texas. So the easiest way to get in was flying to Casper. Unfortunately, the day that he flew in was also a day that we had a pretty significant uh, snowstorm, blizzard. And the interstate uh, was blanketed in snow, probably 18 inches worth of snow. And they had closed the, the interstate. And Ray volunteered, he had an international travel all, and he volunteered to take me to Casper and we would pick up uh, your uncle. Well, the got down the road just a little bit and there were the barriers across the road and there was a highway patrolman, a highway patrolman sitting there in his car. Ray drove right up to him, got out. They knew each other. They talked for a few minutes. The highway patrolman just motioned us to drive right around the barriers, uh, which I thought was rather interesting that, uh, I, you know, he must have uh, known Ray and, and knew that if there was anybody that could make it, Ray could. Uh, we got about uh, halfway between there and KC, and suddenly we noticed that the car was overheating. We got out, and what had happened, it was so cold that the uh, radiator hose, you know, how it bottoms out at the, at the, at the bottom uh, and, you know, it's far from the heat because the heat of the engine ri uh, rises up and this was down low. It had frozen and there was no uh, circulation, water circulation uh, into the engine. So <laughs> Ray and I got out and uh, we managed to crawl under the car, get the radiator hose off. And remember now it's got a big chunk of ice in the bottom of the radiator hose. So we put the radiator hose on top of the uh, engine, which was warm, very warm, but we had all the water drained out. So Ray and I had to go down through the uh, borrow ditch, uh, you know, climb over a fence. Each one of us had a big bucket. Uh, we went down to the creek. I don't remember which one it was, maybe South Fork or Crazy Woman, something of that nature. Uh, we had an ax. We actually <laughs> chopped the ice, got the buckets, got the water out, walked back. Remember, the snow's pretty deep at this point. <laughs> You're not easy walking. Get back up there. The radiator hose, ice uh, uh, pocket, or the, the piece of ice in there melted by that time. We put the radiator hose back on, uh, tighten the clamps, and then poured two buckets of water into the radiator. It had no antifreeze, but it did have water. Yeah. And then he had uh, some uh, old cardboard in the back of his car, and we put those over the uh, front of the car, you know, where you have the uh, airflow through the radiator to 
kind of keep it from getting too cold. And we took off again. We made it all the way to Casper. It um, took us probably twice as long as we normally would. We were able to pick up your uncle, and uh, uh, he was able to buy some antifreeze there, poured it into the <laughs> car, and we got back. We did it all in one day. Uh, it did, there's I, just I don't remember how he got through the barrier from Casper. I, I just vividly remember sitting in the in the car when he was talking to the highway patrolman going, how are we going to manage this? And it, he just talked him into letting him go through. So it was quite an adventure. Uh, yeah, you're on your I'd, own. Nothing I'd ever experienced before in my life, I'll assure you. <laughs> I love that, you know, you're just on your own out there. It, and, and that um, he had everything. This has always stuck with me is how prepared you have to be here. Eric and I, when we leave the house in the winter, you know, the back end is full of everything that we might possibly need. Because if you go off the road, you may be by yourself for a very long time. Or if your radiator, you know, uh, hose freezes, <laughs> you may be the one fixing it on the side of the road. I just love it. Well, you remember Ray grew up on a ranch outside of Cody in uh, the Sunlight Basin. So he was uh, very, uh, you know, self-confident in his abilities. He had probably seen so many different uh, uh, emergency type situations. Uh, it was amazing to me because I wouldn't have thought of what he did. I, yeah. uh, but I learned I a lot real quick right there. Well, it, it, it's one of the things that stands out about being in Wyoming, people in Wyoming, living in Wyoming. And I try to bring out in the books that that is that, you know, don't think about how do I get help? Think about how do I fix this? You know, that people have to be more self-reliant. So at the start of Sawbones was maybe my favorite story, favorite Peterism, Patrickism, and Sawbones started at the Meadowlark Ski Resort with <laughs> Patrick having that been. Could be one of my most embarrassing. <laughs> I would like to hear you tell this story live, live streaming video, the Doctor of the Day story. Well, okay, Meadowlark Ski Area at the time was not well developed. Uh, they had a program which they allowed a physician, and they might have allowed nurses as well, I don't remember. But if you uh, told them that you would be the doctor of the day, which meant you were available in case you did have, in case an emergency happened, in case something happened to somebody there, that they would allow you and your family to ski free. Well, of course, that really got right into my, one of my favorite things, free. <laughs> uh, so I went up there and we, had probably never skied before. I think I had skied one time when I was in Minnesota uh, with some some guys and it was, anyway, we, we knew nothing about skiing and I did not either. So we were up there uh, probably on the bunny slope trying our best to keep from falling. And we get the call over the loudspeaker with the doctor of the day, please report to the lodge <laughs> up high. And of course I, start skiing down, uh, trying to stay under control, which is very slow. And they kept calling and calling and calling. And, you know, I'm coming and I couldn't tell them that I, you know, there was no radios that you had, of course, no cell phones back then. So I'm skiing down and skiing down and they keep calling. And I see that there's this knot of people down below and they're all standing over somebody. Uh, that's lying on the ground. A couple of people are kneeling beside that person. And so I realized that's probably where I should be. So I'm skiing down toward them and trying to hurry, uh, not terribly fast, but trying to hurry. And uh, as I pick up speed, I suddenly realize that I have lost control. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I remember that when we ice skated in uh, Minnesota, that the way you stopped on ice skates very quickly as you turned to the side, kind of what we call a hockey stop. So as I got down close to them, right almost on top of them, I turned to the side to do my best hockey stop. My skis went right out from under me. <laughs> and 
I just plowed right in to the whole group, knocking people down, <laughs> knocking the people off that were on the uh, over this poor. It turned out to be a young girl that had hurt her knee, and they, of course, were extremely upset. You know, and, and you know, were just <laughs> almost almost on top of me, and very sheepishly, I said, "I'm sorry, but I'm the doctor of the day." <laughs> I just, uh, I, can, I, I really, I, I, you know, after we got through with that, I think I left the, the ski area. I was so, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh, but it's still so funny to me. <laughs> just, you, you, you know, it is now, but you can't back. believe how, how embarrassed you felt at the time. <laughs> Here these people were sprawled on the ground. I don't, and I had knocked them down. Oh, I love that. <laughs> So the one book where I departed from starting with a Patrickism per se was um, Scapegoat. Scapegoat, I started with my dad's younger brother and his family showing up with the kids, all seven of them, unexpectedly. And that wasn't technically a Patrickism story. It was more based on my memories of um, adventures with them in Colorado with uh, all that big group. But I figured there was no better way to push your um, planning and expense control buttons than to show up with uh, seven extra kids on an adventure. So I'll skip that one. But there were two of my favorite stories at the beginning of Switchback. This was when I wrote Switchback, I didn't know I was going to keep writing the series and I was blowing through all my good stories. Now I have to work a little harder. But um, I wanted to, to have you start with um, being a young doctor in Buffalo, Wyoming, 1976, the first time you got a call from, what was the lab tech's name? Alex it, McNabb. Alex McNabb asking you to come in to see an unorthodox patient. So if you could. Well, that wasn't the way it started. Remember we had, we were on call yeah. at the hospital. There was no, the, there was an emergency room, but it wasn't staffed as such. And as a physician on call, you actually stayed at home. And if somebody came in with an emergency, uh, they would pull a nurse off the floor or, or, or Alex. Alex was kind of the jack of all trades. He was the x-ray tech. He was a lab tech, uh, orderly. I mean, he was just, he was just a lot of things at the hospital. So he called me at home and said, doc, we got, uh, we got a patient here. You need to come see. That's it. And of course I drove to the emergency room and uh, parked, walked, into the emergency room doors and you there was a couple of uh, bays in through there they weren't rooms they were just bays with curtains around them and uh, usually you would see where the patient was lying on a gurney or the family or somebody around them and there was nobody in there <laughs> you know alex was sitting at the desk i should have realized that there was something wrong because he was sitting at the desk with a nurse and i said alex you call me in where's the patient and he said, well, doc, the patient's out in the, the uh, parking lot. And I said, Alex, why are you pulling my leg? What are you, what's going on? And he said, no, doc, I'm serious. The patient's out in the parking lot. I said, okay, let's go see what's going on. I expect to walk out there and find somebody that has seriously mangled their leg or, you know, some something, and they were still in a vehicle that they had carried him in, and we were going to have to try to get him into the hospital. We go out there and there's a horse standing beside a horse trailer. And <laughs> Alex walks right up to this and there's a cowboy that's uh, holding the uh, lead rope. And, and Alex says, well, doc, here's your patient. <laughs> and of course, I said, Alex, come on. You know, <laughs> you're kidding me, right? He says, doc. No, no, you don't know. But when uh, Dr. John, Dr. Pat, are uh, here and the local vet, who was Tracy Rhodes at the time, uh, you know, leaves that uh, he actually checks out to them and they're kind of the emergency vet. And you're on call and they're not here. So that makes you the emergency <laughs> vet. <laughs> Alex, I've, I've never treated a horse. <laughs> had horses, but I've never treated a horse. And he said, Doc, do the best you can. <laughs> okay. I said, what's the problem? Well, the, the guy said, I think he has a broken leg. And I said, okay. And so we go back to where the hind leg was. I've forgotten. I think it was the left hind leg. And, you know, I kind of 
palpate down through the leg. And I can see he's standing on three legs and he doesn't have any weight on that one. And, and it's pretty obvious when I touch the leg that the horse is in, you know, uncomfortable. And so I looked at Alex and I said, okay, Alex, I see the problem. Uh, what do you think we ought to do? And he said, well, doc, don't you, there's a person, wouldn't you take an x-ray? <laughs> I said, yes, Alex, we would. He said, I said, how are we going to do that, Alex? We can't get him in there. Doc, haven't you heard of a portable x-ray unit? <laughs> oh, God, Alex, okay. <laughs> so we run back, walk back in, we get the portable x-ray unit. Uh, at that time, we didn't, you know, you still had to use the x-ray plates. So he lined him up, got, I, I held the plates. We took a frontal view and a side view, an AP and a lateral. Took them back in. Um, we, uh, you know, put them through the tank so you could uh, uh, get the pictures. We looked at them. Obviously, there was a fracture. It was non-displaced. It was, you know, it broken it, but it, you know, the the ends of the break were pretty much together. So I said, "Well, Doc, uh, Alex, uh, uh, you know, what What do you think we ought to do? I said, I, I don't know at this point what to do. And he said, well, Doc, if they were in the emergency room here, wouldn't you put a cast on it? I said, okay, Alex, you're right. I would. So we got the cast card. Back then, we didn't have a fiberglass. All we had was plaster. So we had to go out there, and uh, he helped me. We made a plaster cast. And we covered both joints above and below the fracture. I made it twice as strong as I normally do. Uh, and uh, we wanted to dry quickly. <laughs> so he taught me the trick of using a hairdryer. He went out there and got a long extension card. We brought the hairdryer because you had to let these dry. Uh, and usually it would take 30, 40 minutes to dry. And he brought out a hairdryer. Here we are out in the parking lot with a cast on a horse's leg with a hairdryer blowing it up and down so that it dries as quickly as possible so the horse wouldn't use, bend its leg, you know, and break the cast. And it didn't. What uh, a good horse. I mean, thank goodness you got a horse. Well, that, yeah. it, they had a twitch around its nose. Ah, okay. <laughs> so the horse, the horse was thinking about other things besides us working. <laughs> and uh, it worked well. I actually got a call from the vet two days later and he thanked me for what I did. And he said the cast was still on. In fact, he said it looked so good. He was going to leave it on for another week before he changed it. So uh, I learned veterinary medicine very quickly. And Alex was very, <laughs> very good. But I learned uh, that Alex had a very dry sense of humor. <laughs> and that wasn't the only practical joke he pulled on me during the time we were there. <laughs> you know he had to love that that you had oh, no dear. you can't believe how much he loved it he, <laughs> was, he, he loved every minute of it <laughs> the other story that i started switch back with was uh with was that you had a patient that kept coming in to re i believe replace the cast on his ankle you want to tell us <laughs> about that story well, I was in the clinic and they uh, went into a room uh, and a young man was in there uh, and, uh, you know, introduced myself and asked what the problem was. And he said, well, he hurt his ankle and he wanted to, to see what was, you know, whether it's broken, what's wrong with it. Uh, and the young man's name was Chris Ledoux. Uh, I knew nothing about Chris Ledoux. I, he was just another patient to me. Just He was my age. Well, I didn't know it at the time. I just went in, we sent him in, got an x-ray, and he did. He had a fracture of his ankle. Luckily, it was a fracture of what they call the, the fib, fibula, not the tibia. It was the fibula, which is a small bone on the outside of the ankle, non-weight bearing. So uh, as I'm applying a cast, casting skills I've learned from the horse, by the way. <laughs> uh, applying the cast, you know, we have time. I'm sitting there and talking to him, and he starts telling me a little about himself, and uh, he didn't tell me any of the singing part, but he started talking about himself being a rodeo cowboy and how he, you know, he had to rodeo every week. And so please uh, do what what I could to make the cast strong enough. And uh, so I put a, a uh, what do we call a walking heel on that. We didn't have cast boots back that time. You had big rubber heels that you could incorporate into the cast. So I was doing all that. And 
I got to, you know, probably 15 minutes of time. Really had a very nice conversation. Very, very nice guy. And but I gave him my usual admonitions. Please don't get the cast wet. Please be very careful with how you, you know, use the cast. Uh, nothing. This cast is plaster. It will, you know, break or disintegrate. And oh, he shook his head. Yes, yes, he would. <laughs> well, <laughs> a week passes by, and, and uh, I go back into a room, and there's Chris Ledoux sitting there on the table, and that cast <laughs> was just, you know, broken to smithereens. It was <laughs> all broken up, and obviously, he told me he had ridden in the rodeo, and he hadn't been on the cast, and he'd been out there, and so I knew that this was going to continue, so we, just, we recasted it, and probably for four weeks straight, Every week he came in and we would put a new cast on there. Um, and I bet you it was not, oh, it was several years later. Um, I hadn't run back in touch with him. I was listening to the radio. <laughs> there came a song by Chris Ledoux and I thought, I know oh, the Chris Ledoux. Uh, this is the same, uh, came, same guy that I, you know, I'd met before. And obviously it was, so. Um, I have a great fondness for, I had a great fondness for him then and unfortunately he passed away way too young, but, uh, I still, still love listening to, uh, to him on the radio. I, I visited the Chris Ludwig Park in KC and they've done a wonderful job uh, memorializing him. He was a, he was a great man. And what was to me most striking about his self-effacing nature and your complete lack of touch with the outside world is he was the world champion bronc rider, a uh, world champion bronc rider at the time that you at were working time. with him. And he's just mm -hmm. like, yeah, I'm a rodeo cowboy. I got to go out and make money on the weekends. <laughs> That's all he ever said. He never, never <laughs> told me anything like that. And, and I saw him many times. So yeah. he had plenty of opportunities. He, I never knew that until later. Well, he kept you in business at least. <laughs> he was <laughs> very fun to be around though. Oh, I love it. Well, you have been a very good sport um, from the beginning about these books. Although you probably thought I was a little bit crazy um, when I first said, I'm writing you into a book. I'm, I'm going to, as I said, I didn't realize it was at that point going to be six or the next three that I have planned after that. But has anything about it been um, especially, uh, a surprise to you about being the the uh, featured character in a book, or uh, how has it gone? I was very surprised. Uh, <laughs> I had certainly had <laughs> I had no idea you'd end up writing a series. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like anything when you when you hear your voice, it's always surprising how you sound because. You sound differently than what you think. Uh, it's kind of like looking in a mirror. I mean, <laughs> you don't yeah. look, look exactly like you think you're going to look. And when I read, especially the first character, you know, I thought, <laughs> oh my gosh, he wasn't that stern. He, <laughs> he wasn't, <laughs> you know, uh, that pushy with what he was. I always looked at it, I wasn't pushy. I, you know, I was just encouraging. <laughs> I to be very, very encouraging in what I try, you know, I thought that a lot of things that we did for the for the betterment of everybody. And so I, I do. I, I will agree that I did uh, encourage very strongly that you guys <laughs> get in the outdoors and do it. But Just for the bit. most part, uh, you did uh, you did it willingly and uh, lovingly. I, you certainly yeah. loved the trail rides we that we went on. And that was that was something. Uh, I don't know. Paul loved him as much as you did, but I know you did. Paul was your... talking about falling asleep on horseback um, uh, in the last um, when I interviewed him, and no one could believe. Very few people could believe when they read the books that that's a thing. And I said, "Oh, it is a thing." <laughs> he fell asleep on a horseback uh, on uh, bareback. Yeah. And stay. He would on. lean over, and his head would be on the horse's neck, mm -hmm. and he would be asleep. He just oh, was. He, 
he he stayed on almost all the time. You rem I do remember one time when he fell off and he was out not too far out of the, the front of the house and I happened to be at the home at the time. And of course we hear him crying outside and we look out and there's his horse Duke uh, standing over Paul, all four legs over the top of Paul. He's underneath and Paul is on the ground. And I'm sure what had happened is Paul has fallen <laughs> off the horse because he fell, went to oh, sleep. Asleep. But he, I, he, that was absolutely true. He, he did it many times. I've also had people say that doctor of the day, no, that uh, vet story at the beginning of the books couldn't be true either. It's one of the reasons I wanted you on here telling these stories. Um, I would say that there are things about Patrick that I do exaggerate for the sake of drama, but I don't have, I don't have to go far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, you could, if, if, there were several other vet stories that uh, that happened. That was probably the the funniest because I was totally surprised. Yep. From that point on, I you know I knew that they came in, uh, that they were coming in. So uh, uh, there weren't a ton of them. I, it didn't happen that that often. But that like wasn't the only, that the, wasn't the only one. The big Great Pyrenees too. I like that one. Oh, that was uh, <laughs> that was very. Very interesting because, uh, you know, they called in beforehand that they were bringing in this dog that had been caught in a bear trap. So by the time I got there, I knew what to expect. Uh, but they brought it in. He was in the back of the pickup. And as I walked out to him, that dog snarled, growled, <laughs> and very menacing. Mm -hmm. and big. I, knew I, I knew I wasn't getting that close to him. So I had to figure out some way to... Uh, uh, you know, make the dog go to sleep. Uh, I knew nothing about uh, canine medicine. So I went in, uh, I got on the phone to call C uh, Casper. There was actually a veterinarian hotline, believe it or not. And I talked to somebody there. They gave me what I could use. I forgot what, what drug. It was uh, one of the ben benzodiazepines, like a Valium or something at that time that I could use. And then we drew it up and uh, we went back out and I was going to inject the dog. But the dog was just still so vicious looking and growling. So I handed it to the owner of the dog and I said, here, <laughs> you give the shot. And they did. And the dog let him give him the shot. The, you know, 10 minutes, the dog was pretty much down. It actually took both of us to go out and, you know, extricate the uh, dog's paw, because that was a very strong trap. It was a big trap, very strong steel. We got it off, uh, brought the dog in, x-rayed it, bandaged the dog up. I don't I don't remember if he had a broken leg or whatever, uh, but um, the dog did well. Uh, but if it hadn't been for that veterinary hot, hotline, I, I might still be there trying to figure out how to take care of that dog. Well, you know, that there are signs up in the mountains. You'll go hiking in the areas where the sheep are run, you know, up around 10,000 feet in the bighorns. And there's signs that say sheep herding dogs, not friendly, do not approach. Their job is to protect the sheep. That, you know? That's true. And that's this this dog's job. And they're very large animals, very large yeah. dogs. And very I, intimidating. Yes. Very intimidating. I have one, and he was hurt too, so not happy. I have no. one last story I want you to tell. We're going a little longer than I did with mom and Paul, but you're doing so great. And and this story just almost makes me weep. It's a long story for the, those of you that are watching, but it's worth it. And that's the story of being a young doctor and having an older woman come in during a blizzard with a problem that you and the other young doctor didn't know how to fix. Um, the Mrs. Marton story. If you would tell, I am going to use that one to start a, a book, but it, it will not be the next one. But go ahead and share it. It'll be the advanced treat for those that um, watch this show in, in uh, ahead of the book getting written. In that area were uh, a group of people that settled that uh, had come from Spain. They were uh, background where they were called Bat, Bosque, Basque. Wonderful folks, very, very uh, uh, high work ethic, work ethic, but they were a matriarchal family. The, the uh, women were kind of the 
you know, the, the queens of the family. As it should one, be. Uh, and one evening, uh, again, I had just happened to be on call to call me in, and uh, Ms. Martin, she was the grandmother, uh, was in the emergency room, and she was having severe abdominal pain. Um, uh, after examining her, I realized that uh, she had a bowel obstruction. I did not know exactly what it was, but through the examination, I could feel that there was a big lump down in her groin, and I probably... Uh, you know, it was a, what we call a strangulated ingual hernia. It was a loop of bowel that come through. Uh, it, it had swollen so much, and tightened around it, that uh, by now it, uh, it was unable to be reduced. You couldn't push it back in. Uh, she was running a fever. She was hypotensive, getting shocky. We knew that it was, you know, it was probably what you call strangulated. The blood supply was cut off, and it was a surgical emergency. I mean, right then, problem was it was severe blister. And I called up to Sheridan where uh, Dr. McLean, our surgeon was. Uh, he was said, I'm sorry, I cannot get down. There is no way I can get down there. Oh, I'm just sick. I, you know, I, I'm just debating myself. So I go out and talk to the family and I tell them, I say, this poor lady has a problem that uh, I have never fixed before. Uh, you know, if we do surgery, I cannot guarantee you she's going to make it through the surgery. Uh, I can guarantee you if we don't do surgery that she's not going to make it through. There's, there's no way. But <clears throat> what, what is the family's uh, thinking? And they just straight looked at me and said, you're a doctor, aren't you? <laughs> I said, yes. And then I want you to fix it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, at that time, I had, blizzard, you can't fly her out. You can't bring anybody in. You can't you were do anything. Dead. You were that was it. Well, fortunately, my partner, the, the two older dogs, both of whom had uh, done more surgeries than we had. Remember, we're young. We're just out of residency. And his name, other guy, his name was Dick Green. Uh, he lived close enough to the hospital that I called him, and he came in. So we <laughs> took her back to the OR. Uh, I had done a lot of anesthesia, so I went ahead and put her to sleep. We used halothane a lot back then, which is gas. And uh, so I had one of the nurses monitor her, put a ambu bag over there, the halothane mix to it so we could keep her asleep. And uh, Dick and I uh, uh, opened her up. And uh, we were, you know, went down there and found this, uh, loop of bowel and it was unfortunately just as we had envisioned it was it was a small part of the small bowel that had uh, was gangrenous by this point and there was only one way to fix it and that was a bowel resection neither one of us had ever done a bowel resection now we'd been we'd been out in there uh, you know and watched it <laughs> and as a resident or student usually the most you ever did was older tractors back then to give a good uh, surgical feel so you could see what's going on. But we did it. We uh, uh, resected the bowel, clamped it off. Uh, we put it back together, did a uh, you know, three layer closure as best we could. Uh, we, of course, irrigated our abdomen out copiously, put antibiotics in there, closed her back up, put a drain in so she could drain, had her on IVs, IV antibiotics, took her back to you know what we had as an ICU. Uh, both of us did the sign of the cross, <laughs> yeah. talked talk to the family. <clears throat> as uh, you know, our expectations were not great. She was an older woman. She's probably 80 years old. Um, within two days, she was, uh, you know, a febrile, uh, had great bowel signs. She did well. Uh, left the hospital uh, probably a week later. I was at a uh, uh, wrestling tournament there in Buffalo. They were in the gyms, the basketball gyms. Mm -hmm. And I walked into the tournament. Of course, you had the stands on the side. And this, her son, he was there. He was a relatively large man. Not high, not tall, but I mean, very uh, 
muscular. He came bounding out of the stands right in front of everybody, ran up to me, picked me up in a bear hug off the ground, swung me around like he would somebody on the dance floor and just started crying and thanking me for saving his mother. Uh, you know, I was I just, I was so taken aback, but so happy. Uh, we were very, very fortunate. I, you know, the, the, the chances of that happening again are not great, but uh, it did. And she got well and uh, they were, they were uh, extremely, extremely pleased. And uh, I was, I was happy that we did it. Uh, I was, very nervous about it, but I was very happy we did it. What is, you know, when you think back on that time, like you were talking earlier, no cell phones, no radios, no YouTube. You can't even watch somebody else do it. You can't yeah. look up the procedure. Did you guys have books or things where you look things up really quickly or did you just basically talk it through and go, oh gosh, here we go? We did have books uh, that you, you talked about, you know, you did talk about a bowel reception. Um, you know, obviously it was, you know, had, you did have some, uh, but mostly it was from, from memory, from watching before. Yeah. Uh, we'd done, you know, we'd done a lot of surgeries where we had been part of the surgery. As I said, we had never been, either one of us actually done the bowel resection where we'd sewn it, uh, you know, where you clamped it off, you had to sew it back. You had, we had what call, was called bovies back then, a little electrical cautery. And you, when you would, you know, especially where the blood vessels came from, the omentum came up there, you would get little bleeders and you would have to use the bovie to, to stop the bleeding. And, you know, we'd done some of that, but this was, this was definitely our first. And, and I have to admit my last, <laughs> I, I never did another bowel resection, never had to. I was able to, I was able to get a, a surgeon in after that. Uh, but you no, know, it was it was impossible. They, nobody could come. We we tried, and, so that was just, and then it's the it was in, So if it doesn't go well, and you're at the wrestling tournament, and you run into her son, it's a totally <laughs> different interaction. It probably would have been a very diff different interaction. You're a doctor. Well, we, we did our best beforehand to explain to him the the uh, chances and the difficulty involved in doing the procedure, but they were very adamant that uh, we. They wanted us to do it. And <laughs> well, I'm glad you did, because as you said, she would have died otherwise. Um, and when I write this scene, I think I'm going to need a lot of help. I was I was following you, but uh, there was there's words there that are they're not a lawyer or a writer words. So get ready. <laughs> OK, <laughs> well, I kind of uh, condensed the story anyway. So. Yeah, you, you do know you've probably noticed I do pare those suckers down to the shortest possible distance between start and uh, finish to keep people's attention. But I just I love that story. It's so there's so many things about the stories that you've been telling that draw together what Wyoming is to me, what 1970s Wyoming is to me, what small town is to me. What, you know, we, we've barely touched on uh, the wilderness medicine, but that really runs through the books. You know, just that that whole the marriage of I want to get out there. I want to do extreme things. I want to take my whole family with me. But you got to be ready for anything. So it's been it was a, not only a different time, but a different people. I don't know. I remember you. there was one one gentleman that I took care of maybe for a year. Uh, he had lung problem, chronic, you know, obstructive lung disease. He fortunately had been a smoker and an old rancher, but a wonderful man. Uh, and I kind of nurtured him through the last year of his life. And um, he died. And lo and behold, the family asked me to be one of the pallbearers. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, and only in Wyoming. Yeah. I had to develop this kind of a relationship with a people, a group of people, a family in a period of time. And obviously I was so uh, overwhelmed, uh, yeah. pleased. And I did, I was uh, one of the pallbearers at uh, this gentleman's funeral. And, you know, that it's only Wyoming and maybe only that per period of time, the times before where uh, you had the people that, uh, you know, you were that close, you know, that close in medicine or that close, even as friends. 
yeah. it, it, was, it was just a, a, a very uh, <clears throat> a wonderful time for the, to be there and be with the people there. So we're going to wrap it up now. I loved that story. That's going in the books. Um, I, <laughs> I, I want to wrap it up, but I'm going to end it by saying that um, that after all these years away from Wyoming, after spending weeks at a time coming up in the summers and visiting in the last few years, you have finally successfully talked Suzanne, Susie. And by the way, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but it says Susie below you because he's yes, on my mother's computer. And and I have loved that so much. I just didn't even tell him how to fix it. That is not Susie there. That is Peter. But uh, that that you actually now have a place up here and spend the summers here. And, and we sure do love that. Well, it took a while <laughs> to get her back. Uh, I don't know that she ever. Well, she, she's just always afraid that we were going to come back up here for good. And as soon as I, I came back up to Wyoming, I would never leave again. And after we, you know, we started coming back for short periods of time, she realized that uh, I wasn't going to bring her back up here for a winter. Uh, you know, she definitely, she likes it up there. And uh, so we've, we've got our place and absolutely love it. And, and she's, she's, uh, just thinks her daughter's crazy because I love the winters, but maybe I'll maybe I'll be singing a different tune if we have a couple of really bad ones. But man, winters up here are beautiful. That's all I'm saying, Mom. See, Mom, we won't make you do it, but it's awesome. <laughs> all right, so Dad, thank you, mwah, mwah. and thank you, uh, thank you, everyone that has listened in. This ended up being about a. 45, 50 minute program, but I think every second of it was worth it. Even if I'm the only one that got to listen to these stories, it was worth it. Dad, love you. Love you too. Thank you. Thanks for putting up with the books. <laughs> Enjoyed them all. All right. And for the rest of you, uh, Snaggletooth, uh, March 17th for the ebook. And I uh, hope you're enjoying the series as much as I'm enjoying writing them. See ya. <laughs>